it was on the edge. We, we know that uh, nothing, no people was far more north than we, we were. Yeah. Hello Bingings and welcome to Longyearbyen, the most northerly town in the world. A town where it is currently a balmy minus five degrees. But what it lacks in centigrade, it more than makes up for in post-apocalyptic feel and beer jackets. Because despite having a population smaller than the population of polar bears here on Svalbard, uh, there is a craft brewery. I'm here to do book research, to learn about how important beer is to a community this isolated. But it was a great opportunity also to make a film about it, to visit Svalbard Briggery, the world's most northern brewery and the brewery that probably faces the most ecological uh, barriers to making beer. And I think the fact that they make great beer, the fact that they've come up with all of these solutions to their challenges just shows how important beer is to you, to humans, wherever they are in the world. Svalbard means cold coast in Old Norse, and it's an archipelago just 800 miles south of the North Pole. It sees the midnight sun in summer, and in October the sun sets and doesn't rise again until February, with average temperatures of minus 25 degrees. Spitsbergen, which means pointy mountain, is the biggest island and home to Longyearbyen, the most northerly permanent town in the world. It was once home to trappers and whale hunters, and later coal miners, but today it's mainly researchers, adventurers, and people who cater to Svalbard's main industry, tourism. I was visiting kind of out of season, in between the Arctic summer and the dark season, so I could get a feel for real island life and hang out with the locals. The best place to do that was the Carlsberger pub, a bar in the centre of town set up by a former miner that wears its history on its sleeve and is known as a local's hangout. There I got chatting to the manager Peter, who filled me in on life on Svalbard and how its pubs are at the heart of it. Right, well Peter, thanks so much for having me here. Yeah, it's it's an incredible space mm. that you wouldn't necessarily expect coming through the, the front doors, I guess. Yeah, you kind of don't think uh, that you're going to find a bar like this in a shopping mall. Yeah, or, or indeed in a part of the world <laughs> yeah, yeah. like this as well. So can you tell me a bit about the, the history of the bar? So basically this bar was open in, I actually don't remember the, I think it's around mid-October 1998. Mm -hmm. It was basically open as a bar for uh, locals or mainly miners at that time. That was actually what was most happening in the town. And the funny thing about this bar as well is like, because uh, everybody kind of has the, their own place in the bar. We have a, like a local table, everybody, they're sitting exactly at the same spot. And when certain different uh, groups of the town come in, they have usually sit in the same spots. Mm -hmm. It's very... Uh, so I've got to be careful where I sit later. All except that table over there. Yeah. Uh, besides that, that's like the only table I reserve right. all the time for a, a specific group, as they call themselves, the KB Council. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's KB? Uh, sh shortening for Carlsberg oh, Pub. So uh, yeah. we need to uh, ask people, it's always KB, it's never Carlsberg Pub. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can sound like a, like a local by calling it KB. Yeah, yeah. There Fake it Noted. until you make it. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, how did you end up working here? I guess you weren't working here in 1998. No, that's, that's actually when I started working in bars in Oslo. You know, uh, me and my um, girlfriend, we just like, Usually say I took the wrong plane up, but, but uh, we were just um, had an opportunity, wanted to do something else. The weirdest thing is like when I moved up here, I was sitting and was like, am I ready for this pitch black darkness for like three months? Uh, but after a certain period of time, it's like you kind of get adapted to it and it's such a more calmer period in a way. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, a, I would say Svalbard isn't for everyone as well. I see a lot of people struggling a little bit with sleep and uh, being a little bit uh, lacking routines in the dark season, meaning yeah. that you uh, 
yeah, you wake up one day, it's like, which day is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you must lose your sense of time. Too. Yeah, yeah. You need to, to have extent, some yeah. proper things for yourself, your own little routine to, right. yeah. Did you drink here before you came and worked here? And I actually started working up at Husa. Uh-huh. So who's this like the, well, how to say, the proper institution of this place. That was like the community house that was built for the miners. It has a super cool story with it as well. It's like, it was actually built for the miners so that everybody in town can like meet at the center in a way. Uh, because back in the day, because who's this? 70 years old or something they had uh, didn't have much uh, uh, at that time so it was important it was supposed to be up there so you started working there as a bar manager ended up being more the restaurant manager as well and having the full responsibility and then it just two and a half years later in a little pandemic in the middle as well I was ah fuck it let's do something else and it opened up an opportunity to get down here so, see, there's that, the Husa, the sort of the cultural centre, but it feels like this is a cultural centre as well with, you know, the locals and... So I feel like people have a tendency to go out, not binge drink, that is probably more for Friday and Saturday, like normal in a way, but go out on more days of the week, just meet over a couple of beers and, uh, and have this pub feeling that you might have in Britain. Yeah compared to because like in Norway that that's not like the same thing but up here definitely and and I guess that dur during the longer nights and, and stuff like that there's there's not as much outdoor stuff you can do not as many activities you can do so that indoor spaces become more yeah, yeah, yeah definitely uh, but also as well I feel this community is kind of good in activating uh, itself like the period we're in now for the, the festival year the Smok Svalbard festival is coming up now and like, uh, and there's a lot of things happening, but it's like more dinners, events and stuff like that. It's like end of October, we have the most uh, Northern Blues Festival in the world. Right. I, I mean, I guess everything you do is the most Northern. <laughs> yeah, yeah kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in maybe these, these communities that have built up around mining or around trapping, where there hasn't been a culture before, you're having to create it almost from the ground up to some yeah, extent, yeah. I guess. So yeah. that, might be why people here are very good at sort of self-generating their, their entertainment. Um, it seems absolutely incredible to me that within that is the creation of a brewery. Basically, you're probably going to laugh, but uh, if you see this little, there's a reason why this is called... Uh, the Carlsberger. Yeah. Yeah, the KB. They, they Sorry. tried calling it Carlsberg Pub, obviously, it wasn't allowed. Yeah. So it ended up being the K instead of the C. And uh, if you ask, the most local people up here is like, what kind of beer have they been drinking all their life? It's Carlsberg, sent right. up by the pallets in a green can, not from a tap system, mm -hmm. which we actually have now. I think uh, this, uh, this brewery has made people a little bit much more of aware on beer. But before that, it was Carlsberg, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Don't quote me on that, but uh, <laughs> you probably will. I don't well, care. Uh, yeah, I'm filming this. <laughs> I guess, I, I guess I'm surprised that there is a demand for varied, exciting and, and fresh beer from a place that getting varied, fresh beer would have been a huge challenge. Yeah, 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 definitely. So I guess it just proves how, how important beer is to everyone, not, alone, not just people in isolated areas to, to have great beer. You know, it's something they've pushed yeah. hard to get or at least people like you have and then that's yeah. filtered down. But it's a social aspect of it. It's like meeting, having a beer, having a beer after work, that little thing as well, which is so, so important. Over a few more beers, Peter explained how an archaic law in Svalbard brought in to prevent too much drunkenness among the all-male mining community restricted how much beer you could buy to one case a month and also made making alcohol on the archipelago illegal. The mystery of how a brewery sprung up here got even deeper. But that story will have to wait. I headed back to the hotel, a brilliant place called Mary Ann's Polar Rig. It may look like Disneyland has tried to do a ride for the murder house at the end of True Detective, but it was actually an old mining quarters. In the morning I took a driving tour of Longy Bayan and the surrounding areas, where I learned about the daily life of its inhabitants. Every time you think it's just a normal town, something surprises you. It might be the brutal blast of air as you leave a building. 
or breathtaking views at just about every turn, or how it so quickly turns from town to utter wilderness. I got to explore the latter during a husky ride, and with the sun setting, pulled by a dog literally called Beer. Hey Beer. Hello, hello. We raced up the valley, past several defunct mines, and even to an old Northern Lights Observatory. Perhaps my brain was starting to shut down, but I was beginning to see the appeal of the place. Finally, as part of an annual food festival, I dined at the hotel restaurant, where I served local delicacies such as moose tongue and reindeer, all with beers from the brewery I was visiting in the morning, which broke bleary-eyed and bone-chillingly cold. Hi, beer geeks. It's your Arctic friend Johnny walking down to Svalbard Brewery. Which means walking through an industrial estate, not really along the pavement, or just where the grid goes once the cars have kicked it out. It's about a 15 minute walk from the centre of town to the brewery. And it feels like I've been walking, well, since winter begun, because I am absolutely freezing despite many layers, including thermal ones. But then, just as you think Svalbard's inhospitable, you come across a view like this. I can assure you, that never gets old. And I'm ready for a beer jacket as an extra layer. I was poured a warming beer before founder Robert Johansson took me for a tour of the world's most northerly brewery. Which looks a lot like any other brewery, with some key differences. Most notable is the kiln, which dries spent malt to make fuel for the boiler. An elegant solution to the fact that it's too cold to compost here, and sending used grain to the mainland is both wasteful and expensive. We then headed up to the cosy tap room to talk about what life's like brewing on top of the world. Svalbard has already been worth worth the long trip. It's a stunning place to live. How did you end up living here? Well, uh, I was um, I was 22 years old when I get up uh, first uh, time, and then uh, I was as a coal miner mm -hmm. in the, the old coal mine up in Mine Tree, as we call it up here. And it, it was an old uh, type of uh, coal mine. It was uh, 60, 70 centimeter high, and 200 meter inside. You was working on your knees uh, the whole day. It was um, a tough job. And we get uh, up here, 10 people started up, uh, and after six months, it was two people left. So eight people was uh, going down after six months. Right. So it was uh, a hard segregation of, uh, of people. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then it, uh, yeah, you know, it, the friendship was very good. It had something to do with, uh, it was uh, manual working and, uh, you know, for, to secure until uh, the, the, the people who can, it was three, you know, what you call it, uh, they were working, uh, working uh, uh, afternoon, night, and, uh, uh, you know. So in, in shifts? Yeah, shifts, yeah. yes. And when you was finished, then you must uh, secure everything. So the next uh, shift uh, was uh, getting uh, to, to work. They depending on that you have done your job. Right. So there's a safety. You were looking after oh, each yes, other as well. Yes. Yeah. So you got uh, a good friendship. Um, so it was uh, nice to to uh, to work with that kind of people. I love that. And also, of course, the nature up here was uh, one of the main things that I was staying. Mm -hmm. So we was out uh, every weekend out in the bush with a snowmobile and everywhere on the island. So it was, uh, it was really something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, I was thinking uh, that uh, we are on the edge. That uh, was in my mind when we were snowmobiling out there. Yeah. It was on the edge. We, we know that uh, nothing, no people was far more north than we, we were. Yeah. What was the sort of the beer culture like when you first moved here in 1982? Where where did you drink and what did you drink and 
how much, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, it, it's uh, it's a, bit, a little bit rare, this uh, all alcohol law, uh, because we have restaurants up here, mm -hmm. and then you can drink as much as you want. It's no, it's uh, so. We have one uh, pub up here when I getting up uh, in 1982, and everyone was there in the weekend. Uh, so we was drinking there, and when I, and then we was at uh, you know at the cabins and uh, drinking the beer there, and yeah, it, it you know for for a. Uh, young people uh, in, in, in the 20s, it's, I said, one, uh, 24 cans per month, it's, uh, it's not enough. Yeah, it could be right. two, two nights work. Yeah, yeah. that's, yeah. So um, um, that, uh, we, we took um, 24 of these with us when we was um, going out in the, in the bush and, uh, with the snowmobile and, and they can, in the weekend. But uh, it's also a very real thing, a very uh, strange uh, thing about this. It's that you can drink, you can buy as much red and white wine that you, that you want. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And I tell you why. That's uh, because uh, in that time, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the coal miners was not drinking red wine. It was nothing that they... But all of the, the you know, the, the, the bosses and all of the functionaries and uh, every one of, of them, they was, it was kind of, of, of class, you know. Yeah. They had their own uh, food, they, they was uh, eating uh, for their own and have, um, uh, the, the, then they have wine to lunch and wine to dinner every day in a week and that it, it was a lot of drinking about them. Uh, but we have the, the, the beer. So they was the, the, the guys that is, is, is make this uh, kind of uh, reduction. And, and, uh, so if you made the rules, you made yeah, it yeah, work for yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then so, you know, we get into red wine and, uh, and, and white wine and that, no, that we have full control of that and it's not necessary to. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still like that. Right. You can go to, uh, to, the, uh, to the liquor show, uh, shop here and, and uh, and buy as much uh, red wine and white wine as you as you want. Mm. Then, then I was up here for twelve years, and, uh, and when I get up here, I was uh, I have a private license for for, for flying. Mm -hmm. So I was also um, uh, yeah, nineteen eighty two. When I get up here, I was uh, you know everyone have a nickname up here, and my nickname was Autopilot. Because of the, you know, that license I have. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in uh, 1983, I buy my own plane up here, uh, ski wheels, and uh, 50 pump hydraulic kill, and then you can have the ski up or, or down. Right. So I was uh, out in the bush and flying. Uh, yeah. So while everyone else was stuck on ski mobiles, you were. Yeah, yeah. Flying, flying around. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I was also uh, around to, you know, these uh, hunters around, uh, so I've been there for the winter and have some mail and, uh, you know, some fresh vegetables and that kind of stuff. So it was, uh, it was a nice time. And uh, also then uh, uh, store, uh, the coal company up here uh, have our own, uh, you know, company for flying. So they was flying from Longyear to a, a place called Svea, where they have a coal mine. So I have my plane in, in, uh, in the hangar with this, uh, this coal company because I work there. It was for free. And also the pilot was a mechanical, so he have uh, also fixing the plane for me and everything. And then uh, he told me, well, uh, a couple of years now and I'm retired go down to Norway and take this uh, commercial uh, license and get back and uh, take over. Uh, right. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was uh, going down for uh, nearly one year. I took the commercial license. And it, it, when I get up here, then I start to think about this beer because I have a friend in the, in the Don in Tromsø where I live now with my wife and children. And he had uh, starting to brew home, and I never smoked, uh, tasted this uh, home brew, and I was skeptical to, 
But then I, uh, it, it, was, it was really good. It was much better than the industry type of beer. And, uh, so, um, you know, I was among, uh, one month up here uh, working and one month down in uh, Tromsø uh, for free, you know. So one month off and one month down to Norway. And then my wife was in, um, at work and my children was uh, at school. So I have uh, the kitchen for my own. So I was starting up there. Right. And, uh, you know, you get a lot of friends when you are making beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got into it, yeah. yeah. So I have a 25 liter, I must, uh, yeah, and then a 50 liter. And then I was thinking about to start up here in Svalbard. What about to, uh, to get our own beer up here? Everything up here was, uh, it was everything is imported. And um, a lot of Danish beer up here. Uh, yeah, so Carlsberg, yeah, you know, the, yeah. the main bar here is named after yeah. Carlsberg. Yeah. Yes. And that also because it was a Danish man who was starting up. Oh, okay, yes. right. Yeah. And, um, and then I, I, I uh, took a call to Sissel uh, Mesten, it's uh, the local governor up here. And I asked him about uh, the, what about if I'm starting up a brewery, is that allowed? No, he told me it's not allowed because we have an old law from 1928 that said uh, it's no, uh, you cannot not, uh, make any alcohol up on the island. So uh, I make up my mind and, and, and then send a mail to the, the, the authority down in Norway to, to make them change the law so I could uh, brew up here. And it took uh, five and a half years uh, from I sent that mail until uh, they changed the law in uh, the, the, yeah, this was in in Ju 1st July in 2014 and a, a year after 2015 we was uh, selling our, our first brew here in, uh, in Longyear. Well, before we get to what's behind us and is, is it's incredible what you've put together here those five and a half years was it five and a half years of of waiting or was it five and a half years of more letters conversations yeah. campaigning when i decided to, to send in the letter to try to to get this uh, law change uh, then i also uh, decided to i, I want to uh, have a contact in, uh, in the, the, you know with the local no, with the central government uh, if one person have this case of mine and I'm calling him, uh, Helle She, it was a lady, I'm calling her uh, every month in five and a half years. So, so we you was, make good friends with that lady? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're talking a lot about other things than <laughs> brewing. So it, uh, it took a long time, but I also have, um, I have a job. So, I was, uh, so it was just to uh, forget about it and, uh, and take up once a month, uh, call her and ask her how it goes and that kind. So it, it took, but you, you, you could prepare, of, of course, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, in five and a half years, uh, you can plan and uh, do everything. So I have everything really ready when uh, the law will change. Right. Yeah. So, so that first brew happened in 2015. Yeah. So the, the equipment was, I, I assume, <laughs> built elsewhere. So it was shipped. Yeah. Shipped to Svalbard. Yeah. From from Germany or no? It's uh, Italian, right? Yeah, Italian, and uh, also have a, a brewmaster up here, um, Andreas Hegemann Ries. Uh, he's not here today, but uh, uh, he should be here for three months to teach us uh, to to brew in a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is still here, so he right. be, yeah. So you have been here for eight, eight years now. Yeah. Feels like it goes either way. Like, like you said, some of the miners yeah. disappear very quickly and some people just stay, stay yes. forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what kind of beers were you making in your kitchen? And is that concept translated to here? Yeah, well, we, we find out. Uh, I try everything in, uh, in my kitchen home. Right. So, yes, it, it was, uh, I, I like strong beer. So uh, it was uh, my favorite is uh, that kind of uh, imperial stout and that kind of stuff uh, that you are not uh, drinking a lot of, but uh, like a wine type of yeah, uh, a sipping beer. Bit. 
complex uh, yeah. type of. Uh, and it's uh, they have been my favorite uh, uh, all the way. So of course it's uh, good with uh, summer and uh, and a lighter type of beer. But um, uh, that is my so. But we was thinking when I uh, talk with Andreas and getting up here and. Uh, I was not interested to have this kind of hipster type of beer uh, because it's not so many hipsters up here. <laughs> <laughs> so we are using uh, the original uh, like uh, stout and pale ale and that and not giving them, uh, you know, type of hipster name and that kind of stuff. We was uh, just using the original uh, type of beer and making that and making it uh, in the middle. But uh, yeah. So, yeah, it feels like certainly the core range is classic styles yeah. named after the style. Yes. So that I guess everybody knows what, what this beer is going to taste like. Because I yeah. guess in Svalbard, knowledge about the modern craft beer movements happening all over the world yeah. wouldn't have been that strong. So no. there was no. education to be done, Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yes, yes. But from what I've been drinking in, in the various bars, been lots of, to lots of bars already, um, the beers are incredibly technically very well made. The the Pilsner is is a beautiful example of like a sort of a German Pilsner. Mm. The IPA that I'm drinking, yeah. lovely caramel character with lots of pine and citrus. Yeah. Like yeah. it, everything's very drinkable. But there are some higher ABVs. Yeah. There, which is that is that your influence? Like the stout is seven percent. Uh, we also have uh, a stronger uh, beer that we are making up in. Um, in uh, ma making in uh, or having in in uh, bourbon barrel, and then we take it also up in uh, in the mine tree for yeah. Uh, so the barrels are actually in the mine. In the mine, uh, it's, it's just for some baptizing. You know, it's not you know because it's very cold up there. Yeah. So you cannot get uh, anything out of that. Uh, stewing it up there is, like, it no. It, you know, you you are simply setting the process down because mm. it's uh, two degrees yeah. low. So it's, it's lagering effectively. It's not nothing, yeah. uh, but it's, it's some kind of uh, baptizing, you know, it, 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 to, um, to re we have respect of uh, what uh, the, the city is, uh, was starting up because of the coal mining. And now it's, uh, everything is uh, 2025, we, we have no coal mine left, mining left. So it's uh, oh, oh, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, respect of that. So we are making some uh, beer that has this dark and cold uh, history and that kind. Hmm. So we are using name of uh, people who are working there. And yeah, so this can is, is your can. So this is yeah. Autopilot. Autopilot. And that's you on the can. It is. Yeah. So it's, uh, and we have a number it. You see we have for. Oh, right. So there's only 13,000 Autopilots. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it, so it's a barley wine, like a dark. Yeah, it is. Not, yeah, a, yeah. not an imperial stout, but like sort of no. malty and chewy and yeah, caramelly yeah. as well as that bourbon character. Is. Yeah. So um, and then we are making uh, four of different kind of that. It's uh, two of them are stouts, and uh, one red ale, and uh, one uh, barley wine. So in terms of like the logistics of running a brewery on Svalbard, so. The ice doesn't stop boats getting in anymore. Glo global heating has has, yeah. has seen to that. So, are you bringing in ingredients once a year, or is it able to come frequently? No. And are you sending beer out? Yeah, constantly it's, as well. Yeah, it's no it's no problem. Every ten day, right? We have a boat sh uh, ship here inside. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, hops coming from America, from Europe, and yeah, all different all places. All, all the malt seems to be Viking malt, so Swedish. Yeah. Swedish and Finnish. Swedish and Finnish malt, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, Finnish malt, yeah. yeah. And I, I read on the cans that some of the water is local, yeah. like gl glacier water even. It is. Uh, every, also the water is from, uh, from Svalbard, but we, we know for sure that 16% of the, the water we have in, in, in the beer is from a glacier. Right. And, and the rest is, is that groundwater? Yeah. Or, right, groundwater. okay. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, water is an incredibly important it part is. of beer, so there is an element of Svalbard flavors in 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 these beers, but it everything is. else has to come from yeah. from elsewhere. So we are not uh, doing anything with the water. So it's uh, it, it's very much uh, of uh, mineral, 
and uh, we have a lot of mangan. Uh, it's a uh, very high mm -hmm. uh, the mangan. Uh, so you're getting a taste of that. Of course, when you you have the yeast and uh, and that kind of you have a chemical some kind of reaction in this uh, in the beer. And uh, I heard of people. They say and they they can tell what what's uh, from Svalbard or not. So they right. yeah. It get a little bit rusty, you know, right. that kind yeah, yeah. of, yeah. So, 95% um, of, uh, uh, of, the, of, of the beer in the can is from Svalbard. Like all great breweries, Svalbard Briggery combines delicious beer with an interesting and unique story. It feels like another tale of endurance in a place humans shouldn't really even live, and proof of how vital good beer is to any community. As I headed back through the bone-chilling arctic wind, I was warmed by both the beer and that very thought, and found myself unexpectedly sad to leave the next day. It's really hard to describe the feeling of this place. Foreboding is too strong. I think immutable is the best word I can kind of come up with. It feels, you feel so incredibly small, and even though all the buildings around here are permanent, they, they're just dwarfed by the landscape and by the weather. Everywhere that you walk into is a refuge. And I've never felt like that. I've never felt secondary to nature. You know, I've spent half my life in London and I've been to lots of wild places, but I've never been somewhere that feels quite like this. And of course they'd have to ration alcohol. You know, imagine this back in the 80s or earlier. All you'd have really to dull that kind of feeling is alcohol and food and friends so i can completely understand why that would be an incredibly important part of your life as well as being fun you know it's a refuge you can take with you or a refuge that you can really enjoy um, but at the same time it's breathtaking and beautiful and increasingly i don't necessarily want to leave i'm in no hurry to leave it is quite a nice feeling to feel secondary, to not be entirely in control and to have to be governed by something other than the endless choice that we have in modern lives. I know there'll be a lot of cynical people being, being like, oh, craft beer in a place like this, why does that matter? And, you know, that's probably down to a lot of people's expectations of craft beer, of being gentrification and all this kind of stuff. It's not, it's vital here. You know, Carlsberg is great did the job for many many years but in terms of the food that's here the culture that's here the music that's here why shouldn't beer be diverse and exciting as well why does food get to be incredibly vital and exciting and beer has to just be lager you know it's it's a vital part of life whether you get excited by it or not And it adds to the excitement of being in a place like this, and that's the diversity, and that's the warmth of it. Man, I miss warmth.